Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone, to your regularly scheduled Blue Jay program, or Red Jay. So, director's commentary time. So, as you all know, for those of you who have or have not seen it, maybe not, I did a video on the worst pirates you've never heard of. Now, my number one kind of like criticism, I guess, not really, is that a lot of people have heard of said pirates in this video. And I know, uh, I like to title things that are kind of like big absolutes claims, you know, like I have some really popular videos that are named stuff like, you know, the dumbest Russian voyage nobody talks about, or, you know, I have like the worst radioactive ideas in nuclear history, or the dumbest war nobody talks about. It's like all these like claims that are like very strong, like saying zero people know about this, zero people talk about it. Obviously, that's not true, because how the fuck would I know about it if that was the case? But for this video, I think while, yes, in recent years, Steed Bonnet, who is a character that I primarily feature in this video, was a guy that recently starred in an HBO comedy show. In the grand scheme of things, he's pretty obscure. Like, if you go on the street and ask 50 people who's Steed Bonnet, they'd be like, I don't fucking know. Or maybe one guy will be like, oh yeah, from like the HBO show. But then if you ask 50 people on the street, who's Blackbeard, they'll pretty much all be able to tell you, oh, he's like the famous pirate dude because he's like a very well-known like common household name. So, I mean, yeah, it's not like literally the most obscure pirate in history, but the thing with obscure pirates who sucked at their job is you don't know about them because they died right away. And that's something that I highlight with my intro to this video, which we will see in just a second. But before we get into that, I want you to talk about the thumbnail for a second here. So yeah, I have uh, I have me with my pirate hat drawn by the lovely Cass. She does all of the artwork for the hats of my bird. She also drew the bird itself. She's the best artist I've ever met and probably will ever meet. But yeah, without further ado, we can go ahead and, and get started. All that was left to invoke his trial by I Iron and flame was one word. Fire! As you all probably know, I had a lot of fun making that whole intro sequence, and I didn't really want to talk during it to interrupt it, but basically, as I mentioned earlier, I wanted to highlight how the worst pirates ever you don't really ever know about because they end up like our little friend Johnny P. Ritt here, who uh, miraculously died on his first outing as a captain. Because, you know, it's a dangerous life being a pirate. You never really know what could happen, and uh, sometimes things don't always go according to plan, and even the most glorious pirates we know of ended up you know, dying anyway, like Blackbeard, Steed Bonnet, who wasn't glorious, but pretty much name a notable pirate, they didn't really get away with it most of the time. And the ones that we don't know the fate of probably weren't positive fates. So, anyway, I really tried to go above and beyond and push myself animation-wise compared to what I've done in the past with the intro of this video. So, there's a few things I was trying to get done with this intro, but let me just first kind of like go through step by step the different aspects of it. So, first off, so each of these are individually drawn clouds that I then put into Premiere and then just using some simple keyframes for uh, position transformations moved across the screen at various rates to simulate depth. So, pretty much parallaxing, which I had done previously in my Wild West video down here. And when I did that kind of like dramatic dual animation thing where I made up a story about like a cowboy, like what the fantastical Hollywood vision of what a cowboy is. It's similar to what I did with that video, but I also did that here. And then I added in some more animation and some more effort than I normally did. And the then I had both a background here drawn, as you can see, for the stern of a ship. And then I moved that down as I moved Johnny P. Ritt at a different speed to, again, capture that parallaxing effect to make it seem like it's three-dimensional image. Playing around with that can really make animations pop. When you're dealing with stuff like what I do, stick figures, 2D animation, cartoony animations, if you really want to add that extra like oomph or emphasis or you really want to like emphasize the dramatic effect of certain scenes, little things like that can I think go a long way. This was really fun. So as you can see, I'm doing frame by frame animation creating a walk cycle for Johnny P right here. I haven't really done this many frames of a walk cycle before. I've had little bursts of frame by frame walk cycle animations or run cycles for various skits that I had done in the past. So if you think back to my Wacky War Tactics 2 video, I had one of my favorite skits of all time was when they had the uh, Indian British soldier running away during the Battle of the Bees from all the bees that were transcending from the tree line above. He was like running and then like fell into a mud pit so that was like an example of me doing a quick little like frame by frame running animation. But for this one, I did a full walk cycle 
where I actually uh, tried to incorporate some animation stuff that I had learned somewhat recently and had been practicing in my free time where I did some keyframes, which is essentially, if I go through these frames here, a keyframe is kind of like the start and end positions of various animations. So like one keyframe would be something like, like this right here where it's the full extended step and then he starts moving his back peg leg forward and then I had another keyframe right here where he is at his height right there so I having him bob up and down as you would as you are walking then like I make these keyframes right so I draw this frame I draw the frame before and then I start drawing all these in between frames until I kind of get like the motion that I'm looking for yeah I'm really proud with this how this came out now this, that right there, I got to stretch my After Effects muscles for the first time in like a hot minute. So I basically, I drew a water line and I took it into After Effects and added in some effects on it to kind of give it this rippling along the whole of a ship. And then after I did that, I took that video layer and I moved it up and down so that it looks like it's swelling against the whole of a ship. And then underneath that layer of waves, as you can see, I had these splashing animations coming up and then showering on to the sun-soaked smiling sailor again utilizing some lens flares here so i will say everything in this intro i animated but i did not draw these wave splashes here I was able to find a, a free animation to do that. I'm kind of ashamed because I really wanted to do that myself because I thought it'd be really fun to do some nice fluid frame by frame animation. But just for the sake of time, I couldn't get that done. And I found this really nice animation that worked out well and basically just used like a free video layer that you can get with a green screen. So I copy and pasted that animation a few times and then showed it again up here to just, you know, show that like that shot was below. And now we're looking up at Johnny P right here. Now, that's the last thing I wanted to talk about there, if I can get back to it. Where Johnny P. Rick gets his head blown off, I have a cannonball that I added a motion blur to and just moved it across the screen. And, you know, like, normally what I had done in the past in videos for violence is I kind of go a little bit overly gory with it because I think it's just funny when cartoons can get really gory. But here I thought it'd be really fun to make it kind of like Looney Tunes-esque. So I actually, I used a reference animation from a Tom and Jerry skit where I think Tom gets punched in the face and then his face kind of, like, pushes inward here as you can see like the folds of his skin is getting pushed in as the cannonball goes through his head and then squeezing his head like an egg just tearing it clean off his shoulders and shooting the blood out the back and just tearing it out while his like hat pops off comically and then it just explodes into various you know shrapnels of brain matter and skull as this bandana is vaporized and then flies back just like a little shotgun blast of brain matter onto his crew behind him it's just like I spent so much time making this like really funny and you only see it for like literally like five frames but it's so worth it and you actually can't even see all of it i realized afterwards when i put this so like the ship is actually bigger than what you see here because i have it rocking right i can't like make the ship the same size as this canvas and then rock it because you would see you know there's like nothing above this so i actually have a bunch of blood on a mast back here that i didn't realize until after i put it into the video that you actually wouldn't be able to see it so you're missing a little bit of the animation but you can still see the blood on like a little bit of the sail here and yeah so that was my intro and I wanted to do a few things right I thought it'd be really fun to have a nice dramatic intro trying to do like a dramatic reading and I hope that that was delivered well I usually kind of have a different narration style where I try to go for more of like a whimsical upbeat happy having fun with playing around with these stories and characters type of narration um, but for this intro I tried to be a little bit more dramatic with it doing like fun different things like wordplay like I, I was particularly proud of um, this alliteration here old peg leg on weathered timber the splashing sea sent sparkling salty spray, showering the sun-soaked smiling sailor, accenting his striking pose like a badge of valiance. So I wanted to have like a lot of really strong imagery and uh, a lot of colorful writing for this narration. So that like if you were blind, you could listen to this and get the exact same effect from this video. You know what's really cool is I actually saw a comment, I think yesterday, where someone said that they were blind and watching my videos, which I thought was really cool. Like I had intended to write an intro that could be something enjoyed by all types of people, including people that are missing certain
certain senses, like the sense of sight or the sense of hearing, you could still kind of like get a nice little snippet of drama from it, right? So uh, I, I thought the intro came out really well. I'm really happy that it seemed to be very well received by you all in the comments. And then the last thing I wanted to accomplish was to kind of like open up the idea for people that watch the Blue Jay channel and watch my content that I can do more than just silly jokes about historical events. I want to open up the door to eventually put different kinds of animations out on this channel. I've mentioned it before and I'll say it again. I plan on doing more types of content than just these videos where I'm talking about historical events. I plan on, you know, eventually making full frame by frame animations of like original content, like skits, you know, I think of like watching a Meat Canyon video or like something by Harry Partridge, like Dr. B's. I want to make stuff like that eventually and put it on my channel. So my own like scripts of original stories and dialogue, not narration, just kind of like full on animated videos. And so this is kind of like giving people a taste of that and I can't remember but there was like some comment I don't know if I'm gonna be able to find it again but basically it said something along the lines of like um Blue Jay's gonna end up like posting full-on animations at some point I'm like exactly that's what I'm trying to kind of get to but yeah I've talked about it before in director's commentaries I eventually want to make different kinds of animations and this is kind of like me playing around with that did I use real ships as a reference for the drawing I did yes actually this ship reference here I was able to find an actual image of the revenge that Steve bonnet sailed or at least an artistic interpretation I wasn't able to verify if it was like 100% an accurate picture of it but it was basically a generic sloop that I drew and I used that sloop and I kind of modified it at various points to make it look like other kinds of ships throughout the video like in this I show this same ship in the distance with more cannons and like a waterline lowered down a little bit to make it look more like a galleon but I didn't want to spend a lot of time drawing all these different kinds of complex sail ships well the adventurous tales of Bartholomew Roberts, Francis Drake, and Blackbeard paint a tantalizing picture of life plundering booty on the high seas. The gods of statistics and reality are always there to remind us that pirate life was much more likely to be as successful and abrupt as our little friend Johnny's here. You know, one thing I will say, I thought I'd get like some comments of people complaining that I call Sir Francis Drake here a pirate, but you know, cause he's kind of seen as like an adventurer or like a privateer. But I think that a lot of people don't really realize privateers are just essentially pirates, but you know, like they're given the thumbs up by a government so like you know he essentially is a pirate you know all things considered but I didn't get a single comment that I saw like complaining about that comparison so sometimes you know I'm not really good at guessing what people might get upset about but you know these are examples of like pirates that I would consider common knowledge or more famous I mean I don't know if Black Bart Roberts would be like someone that you could get everyone to say that they've heard of but like Francis Drake people have heard the name I'm sure Blackbeard people have heard the name I'm sure there were dozens more who ended up as pathetic wretched, miserable failures sometimes in many pieces. Oh yeah, I wanted to make sure I added that little disclaimer. Again, I thought I'd get kind of some shit about like showing people walking the plank because for like people that have like more than a very generic knowledge of pirate history would probably be able to tell you that walking the plank isn't really something that happened pretty much in kind of pirate history. It's something that has been reported a few times. I think there's kind of like one instance that's seen as more credible than most, but it's really, really rare. If it did happen, Happen, did not happen frequently or it wasn't reported at all which you know it's it, who knows like dealing with pirate history is hard just inherently because you're trying to tell the accurate tale of a bunch of criminals on a secluded ship with no outside accountability like you don't have people that can report on what's going on because they're in the middle of fucking nowhere on the ocean so when things happen it's not always super well reported and kind of like a lot of where we get some information from is something like the diaries written by some pirates or court testimony from pirates that were eventually arrested or one of the most primary sources of pirate history that we use today still as kind of like our foundational knowledge of the golden age at least of pirates is a general history of pirates by captain charles johnson that's probably the most famous book on pirates ever most influential for sure it came out kind of i think it was like the 1720s or 1730s so kind of like right at the end of the golden age of piracy and this book while it gave like all the colorful descriptions of all the pirates we know and love today including steed bonnet who i'm going to be talking about in a second was also known to really sensationalize aspects of pirate stories so it's really funny because it's just on one hand a very trustworthy source because it talks about some pirate 
different facts very accurately. Like you can trace down these facts all the way back to court documents where it's shown like undeniably this was the case. But then on the other hand, it'll just straight up make shit up at times to make it more entertaining to read. And this isn't helped by the fact that Captain Charles Johnson isn't a real person that's a fake name used by an anonymous author that no one's been able to verify who they actually are. There's been like people and historians throughout history that think it's a certain author that wrote this book, but we don't know for sure. And that kind of pisses me off, not gonna lie. There are numerous ways one could find themselves pirating during the Golden Age. Many were poor sailors seized by dreams of riches and freedom. Others were normal sailors seized by pirates for their riches and freedom. And some were seized by the Royal Navy before seizing command to seize riches and freedom. Yeah, so basically, there, there are a ton of ways people can become pirates, right? But basically what I'm like kind of like hammering on there was basically piracy was kind of like a class problem. But I actually, I wrote down my thoughts, which fun fact for those of you who care to open them up, I always try to like add in detailed descriptions that are like more serious and down to earth in the bottoms of my videos here. Like I had written down in here basically that the concept of the pirate life is one that has fascinated children and adult alike for generations. It's the idea of pure unadulterated freedom, living free from the shackles of responsibility, regulation, and reality. On a lone vessel dancing along the waves of a vast ocean, the world is truly your oyster and the possibilities are endless. This swashbuckling fantasy has been fueled time and time again by classics like Pirates of the Caribbean in the early 2000s, Treasure Island in the late 1800s, and A General History of Pirates in the early 1700s, which I mentioned earlier in this video. So considering how impactful the pirate genre has been on the greater populace, it might come as a shock to learn that our understanding of real pirate history is relatively meager. That last listed classic, A General History of Pirates by Captain Charles Johnson, remains one of our most primary sources for pirate history during the Golden Age, a novel which we know to have exaggerated and stretched the truth for sensational effect. While unfortunate, it does make sense that accurate recordings of true pirate history are scarce given the criminal and elusive nature of pirates themselves. One isn't really an efficient criminal by making their personal information as known as possible. Combine that with the fact that most pirates came from poverty and low social status, and the fact that many primary court documents have been lost to time, it makes sense that this history can be hard to accurately map and result in much speculation. In this video, much speculation must be made to connect the dots we have about Steed Bonnet's life, for example. Naturally, this can lead to inaccurate assumptions, so with that in mind, I tried my best to choose language carefully when telling this story. Take note of the numerous sentences initiated with it's believed for some insight into when speculations are made. So basically they're just saying that history of pirates aren't very well known, a lot of it is speculation, so ultimately, inevitably, there are inaccuracies in this video. But it's something that we can't help and we have to make if we want to try to like weave together any kind of coherent story. But the elusiveness of pirate history feeds into the fantasy. After all, these were criminals, and if we go back in time and ask them, we'd find many of them wouldn't choose this way of life if given the choice. The story of piracy is a story of class struggle, with rare exceptions like Bonnet aside, who was an aristocrat, the lowest rungs of society were the ones who populated the pirate ranks. Poor sailors who lost their livelihood, impressment victims seeking freedom, privateers losing their state-backed support, and those with nowhere to turn but the sea were the ones who became pirates. It's a position born out of struggle and poverty, the same struggle that can be seen with the Somali pirates in the modern day. In essence, they are no different than the glorified pirates of the Caribbean, disadvantaged victims of society merely doing what they can to survive. And that's kind of like a strong parallelism I really wanted to draw with this video, and again, I'm really kind of getting ahead of myself here, but at the end of the video I talk about Somali pirates, and it feels different, right? We think about these kind of pirates back in the day as like these really like romantic swords washbucklers, right? They're they're really cool, they're savvy, they're having a grand old adventurous time. And then we look at Somali pirates in the modern day as just kind of like these little like dirty criminals who are just like out for blood and for like terror and like just nothing about it seems appealing. And that's because we're viewing them realistically and we're not viewing these pirates realistically. We don't see this as a as a good life because it's not a good life. You know, people don't want to have to be thieves on the high seas. These people that became pirates came from the lowest rungs of society. And so like I highlight that here with this guy here who's just kind of like, he's a poor sailor who really wishes that he could have more freedom, more money, times are hard. He has to turn to something. Piracy is something that is a viable 
viable option for him to survive. And then you have instances where pirates, by pirates kidnapped other sailors and forced them into piracy. This is something that happened actually quite frequently. So like when pirates would hijack a ship, people that occupied really desirable jobs on a ship, like carpenters or surgeons or cooks, they were usually forced into becoming pirates on their ship so that they could have carpenters and surgeons and cooks because that's, you know, that's really important to have. So that was one way people became pirates. Obviously not a very desirable career change when you're forced at gunpoint into a job that you don't really want. And then one of the most interesting ways people became pirates that I heard of was uh, something called press gangs. Impressment was a practice that is most notably seen with the British Navy, where basically um, you would have press gangs that could go around and recruit people into the Navy by force. And usually that would be someone like a drunkard left out on the street early in the morning or just poor people. They could be forced, you know, or homeless people could be just forced into Navy service for conditions that were ironically much worse than conditions working as a pirate. Because, you know, you not only are you working on the high seas during time where, you know, everyone got scurvy and had to eat salted meat and dry biscuits. You also didn't get paid jack shit. You had no authority and no say over decisions made. And you were treated like absolute trash by people who you couldn't go to anyone else for accountability because, you know, you're on the fucking ocean. So this was one way people got into piracy. They would get forced into naval service. And then people that weren't happy with their treatment on ships would then mutiny and then become pirates so that they could have some freedom. And, And because, you know, like with how their life has been so upturned that it was an easy choice for getting into a new life because it's hard to like, you know, go from the Navy back to your home in, I don't know, Wessex or whatever in in the UK. Now, you might think growing up on a farm would build this sort of rugged... I spent a lot of time trying to get his hair looking good. I had a few different versions of his hair that were quite different in styles. Like, I had one that kind of looked more like a Bieber cut. I had one that was a little bit flatter and kind of like frilled up on the sides. And then my friend Venus helped me come up with this style here that kind of gave that nice like wavy, like flowy feel of like kind of like a hot boy or whatever. And I thought it was just kind of like a really cool iconic hairstyle and probably Steve Bonnet might be just dead ass my most favorite character design to date in a Blue Jay video. I just really like his outfit how that came out. I like his hair how that came out. His shape like the body shape and head shape I think are just great. So that design I'm particularly proud of. George I swear to God if you touch my wine glass I will force feed you rose thorns. Sorry sir. I also need you to go pick some rose thorns. Of course, sir. In a very- <laughs> That, uh, that skit, I had a lot of fun with. I really wanted to just, like, write some very, like, over-the-top skit of essentially, I guess, like, domestic dispute. I don't know if violence is the right word, but that whole thing was, like, what? Like, a full minute and a half long, almost? And, uh, like, I got, like, a handful of comments or something saying, like, Hey, Blue Jay, love your videos, but I think just for a little constructive criticism, some of your skits can be a little long-winded. And I know this isn't everyone's cup of tea. But I particularly like just like really well woven dialogue of like a skit that just goes on for a long time. You can see that in all of my videos almost going way back. I always have or almost always have some kind of like long skit or argument that lasts a long time. And it's because I find it really funny. Humor is subjective. That's something that I find funny. Not everyone's going to find it funny. And I totally understand that. So if you don't find it funny, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying you're right. But I think that I think some people find it funny. I find it funny. And I want to add a little something for everyone, right? I have short skits. I have long skits. I have domestic violence and I have just goofy death. So, you know, we got a little something for everyone (laughs) in the skit department. So just like some little fun facts about this skit. While I was writing this video, and a lot of people pointed this out actually in the comments, which I'm really happy with. I hope some people would get the reference. I actually, I was watching through the entirety of Archer, the animated show on FX. And so I took some inspiration and I wanted to have like a Archer style argument in this video. So that's kind of like a little like nod to Archer. And then I wanted to have like a nice little nod to one of my favorite Archer jokes ever from the pilot. So at the end, I have like the slave comes by and he's like, George, I swear to God, if you touch my wine glass, I will force feed you rose thorns. And he's like, sorry, sir. He drinks his wine. Then he just goes like, I also need you to get me some rose thorns. Of course, sir. That's a very clear nod to this skit here. I have to go. But if I find one single dog here, when I get back, I'll rub sand in your dead little eyes. Very good, sir. 
I also need you to go buy sand. Yes, sir. It's like one of my favorite skits. It's like a nod to that little joke. And I got a lot of people that recognize that. And there's a few other parts in this video that are kind of Archer inspired a little bit. I wanted it to be my pirate Archer episode. Also, a lot of the stuff on this table here, I actually pulled directly from actual history about Steed Bonnet. So one of the books that I read about Steed Bonnet talked about the type of food that he would most likely have enjoyed in his estate, which included stuff like roasted ham and fish, various other grape dishes, and then there there was uh, Madeira wine is actually Steed Bonnet's favorite wine. That was a, a literal wine that he actually enjoyed in particular. So that's kind of like where the skit stemmed from was like an argument about him drinking his wine too much. I try to like weave in historical accuracy to my skits, but obviously they're not to be taken as truth because I highly doubt this argument happened. And some theorize that the avid bookworm was captivated with wonderlust of the pirate life from the novels of the time. Pirates were becoming already a little popular and it was said that Steed Steed Bonnet was a very well-read individual. He loved books, and you'll see that later on, as evident by the fact that he chose to install a private library in his personal quarters of his ship. So that's one possible theory. We don't know exactly why he became a pirate. The common reason that's often portrayed in, in like articles and stories is that he was tired of his bitch wife, which, you know, maybe, but that came from A General History of Pirates by Captain Charles Johnson, who, as we've already established earlier, was known to flavor and sensationalize his stories about pirates. So he could very easily have made up that fact just to kind of make it kind of funny and make him look like more of an idiot. Like, yeah, he was tired of his bitch wife and her nagging that he then decided to become a pirate. So, you know, it's a possibility. So I don't want to say it's not true. I'm just saying the reasoning behind it isn't like super well sourced, but there isn't really a well sourced reason at all. There are theorized reasons like his kid died, but that would have happened like years before um, he eventually became a pirate. There was, you know, books that made piracy kind of look kind of cool and maybe he was bored. Other theories include the fact that he had taken out a loan right before he became a pirate or like within like the year before he became a pirate. So he might have been experiencing financial troubles. I find that one a little hard to believe because as a plantation owner, I think you have way more options to deal with financial troubles before you throw away your entire life to become one of the most gruesome criminal trades imaginable. I don't know. I find that one a little hard to believe. Like you could start selling off your 94 slaves before you start putting your neck potentially on the line to steal some tobacco from Spaniards. Other theories that are interesting that I've heard theorized was that during this time, the Jacobite movement was in full swing, which was essentially, uh, I don't want to get too much into details with uh, Jacobites because I'm not super well researched into them, but essentially the Jacobites were a group of individuals who supported the exiled King James II and his descendants after the uh, revolution in British history, so from the British crown. So people theorized that maybe he was a Jacobite, and then this like stirred political tension between him and his wife, because that was a very tense time in British politics. So that's an interesting theory. People have also theorized that people like Blackbeard could have been Jacobites, as evident by other various facts about them that I don't remember off the top of my head. But yeah, there's a lot of theories as to why he could have become a pirate. Hello, good sir. Uh, uh, you seem to be the right rather swashbuckly sort. <clears throat> How would ye like to join me pirate crew, Yarg? Pirate? What, because of a parrot? That's kind of fucked up, man. What, it can talk? <laughs> no, no, it just knows that one phrase. That's kind of unsettling. What, is your monumental ego threatened by the mere idea that something you see as just an animal could possibly be more intelligent than you? Or are you just surprised by the fact that someone told you no for the first time in your privileged life? Or perhaps is this reaction just an outlet for how unsettled you are at your own life circumstances as a whole, spanning from the obvious contention plaguing your marriage to the palpable insecurities encompassing your fostered resentment at the predetermined trajectory of your affluent life? Okay, maybe two. Brock? I really like that skit. I had some people say that was their favorite skit, but that's actually kind of like another little nod to Archer because they had a season where Krieger, one of the characters of the show, was a parrot. And one of the recurring jokes in that uh, season was like a bunch of people saying like, because like, he would just talk like a person and they'd be like, your parrot can talk? And he's like, yeah, he's a parrot. Parrots can talk. Like they just act like that was a normal thing that parrots could do. And so I wanted to have like a funny like parrot talking skit of my own. <laughs> so that's kind of like where the idea of that skit came 
came from. But yeah, I think I really liked my delivery at various lines. Throughout this whole video, I really think this is my best voice acted video to date. I think I'm getting better and more confident at doing character voices, and um, I just really think it, it came out well. Except for the Barbadian ones, which, in order to keep word of his activities from reaching home, he burned to the ground. <laughs> That, <laughs> that that still makes me laugh. I just thought it'd be really funny to like have to Steve ground. Bonnet just being like a psychopath with this like burning scene going on while his like crewmates looking at him like, dude, what the fuck? Like, why are we doing this? And then he giggles, which is also another Archer reference. Holy shit, that's three now. Basically, I'm like, Archer is kind of like, his character is very lighthearted, half-ass, doesn't take much seriously. Uh, he's an asshole and just kind of like laughs at a lot of shit. And so like, here's like Steve Bonnet being Archer esque again with his little psychotic giggle as he's burning down the ship to the ground which rubbed some people the wrong way in the comments they're like um don't you mean to the sea floor motherfucker the sea floor is still the ground there's just water on top of it the ship still burned down and then went to the ground Oh, also this like flame. This is kind of hard to do. Someone asked me like right before the stream started if I ever played with, I think, color correction or filtering. Basically, I had to play around with various like lighting color corrections and added them and added the changes to timestamps to kind of like give this flickering effect. And then I also made a very, 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 very minorly opaque flame layer on top of this, but alpha locked it to just the foreground here. So like you only see it on top of like the ship front here, the railing in their faces kind of like moving to add like a little bit more of like a changing of light value to make it look like there's something burning in front of them. It was a little bit, it was kind of harder than I thought it'd be getting this to like look right. It was very hard. I had to keyframe individually the flickering values to make it seem chaotic and random enough so that it would be a believable fire. So uh, it's like the little things like that that you don't expect to take a lot of time they end up do taking a lot of time. Even with a profitable start, Bonnet's inexperience really started to shine in these encounters, and the crew began to lose what little respect they had for the gentleman pirate. So, as you all know, I have hidden in all of my videos ever since my Victorian London video, a Blue Jay coin, and basically whoever is the first person to find the Blue Jay penny and tell me where they found it uh, with proof, then they get a special role in my Discord server called Penny Hunters, the exclusive club of the first people to find the penny in the newest Blue Jay video. It was found in record time this time, like within the first like few minutes someone pinged me and said where the vi or where the fucking penny was it's right here it's hidden in this like little treasure chest i tried to make it harder to find but i was going to make it like much smaller and more like hidden behind this but i'm like eh i don't want it to be too hard i want people to find it but someone found it right off the fucking bat dude i clearly did not hide it well enough so next time you fuckers are not going to find it for like a week i'm going to make that shit so fucking hard to find it's going to be like 2 pixels wide and i i'm going to keep this roll just for one special individual to finally get after like two years. I'm making it hard. This is it, Peter. The big score. Set the blowy sheets to max and let's get this booty, yarg. Blowy sheet. Full sail. The men say full sail. Uh, sorry, and these men pay your salary? Blowy sheets to max, men. Davy Jones, that's no merchant vessel. It's be a Spanish man of war. <laughs> I mean, Peter, come on. We've all dabbled in red light districts. What? Not a man of whore, man of war! Uh, listen, I I'm not one to judge, but if you're into being eaten, just don't do it on company time. No, not man of war, man of war! <gasps> Cortez himself? He's here? What? How did you get conquistador? <laughs> That's one of my top, like, two or three skits in this whole video. I really like it, but I don't know. I just thought it was funny having him, like, misinterpret him saying man of war for all these other things that rhymed with war. <laughs> and then also the blowy sheets. I find that sometimes I write my favorite skits where I just, like, start typing and seeing where the words take me. I don't really have a plan from the get-go on any of them, but I knew that I wanted to have, like, man of whore. And then I like, just have him, like, come on, we've all, we all dabbled in red light districts. We're we don't need to judge them. And then like man of vor, which I was a little scared to like make a vor joke. And rightfully so, because I had like someone comment like, oh, Blue Jay's in the vor, so cool. And I'm like, no. Some people are really bad at like distinguishing what a character's opinion is from the author's opinion. Just because a character says something doesn't mean Blue Jay, me personally, believes that thing. And it's even funnier in this instance, because he said like he reacted to him thinking he said man of vor with disgust. 
best. So if anything, you should think I don't like Vor, which for the record, I'm not into Vor. I don't know if I need to say that, but I'm gonna say that because some people just need that like hammered in. <laughs> I'm just gonna put that out there. But yeah, um, I just wanted to highlight like the comical kind of like interpretation of what I think life would be like on Steed Bonnet's ship. Like you'd have him just like fucking around having fun as a pirate and like everyone else is just kind of like, come on, man. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> if I had more time, one thing I would have changed. I was first drawing this. I would have had a cannonball come through like the side here, explode this barrel. The shrapnel would have exploded and pierced both of these pirates, Peter and Steed here. And then I would have frame by frame showed them being like flung to the side injured because they didn't die. They were injured as I was getting into it. It was taking me a lot of time. I was really strapped for time in this video. I was working from something like 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. or like 9 a.m. to 2 a.m. just waking up and sleeping, just animating this all the way through to get it done on time. And I was still late by a little bit. And that's kind of my fault because I made the deadline for this video like half a year ago. So I would have put in the effort to do that. But, you know, I, I instead settled for, okay, I'm just going to draw a frame where they're on the ground injured and then just put an explosion effect to highlight that there was a fucking cannon shot there. So like, you know, I wish I could do my original vision, but I still think that this was really funny. The ambitious hunt turned into a rapid retreat as the revenge scurried off faster than Bonnet left his family, but not before the man of war made the sky a lot more inclusive of the periodic table, killing and wounding half of Bonnet's men, including the big man himself. These elements are basically just like things you can find in Cannonball, so like cast iron has iron, carbon, and silicon in it, and then like there's also lead cannonball, so I just like threw up some like elements, but but yeah, just the joke, the sky is a lot more inclusive of the periodic table. I thought it was just a really funny way to explain a fuckload of cannonballs being shot from a man of war at the revenge as it scurried off. This whole story was really funny. I don't find it, or I don't see it talked about a lot when people like tell the story of Steed Bonnet, at least in like various articles I read. I don't know about YouTube videos. I try to never watch YouTube videos on topics that I want to make videos about so I don't get influenced or like do anything similar to what other people have done. And also because I just don't trust a lot of YouTubers to say things completely accurately, <laughs> which is kind of sad because I try to make everything as accurate as possible. But you know, people make mistakes and YouTubers are very uh, susceptible to making mistakes, just given the fact that a lot of the times it's like someone like me who's just one guy doing everything. So I don't have like peer review, which is why I always say don't cite my videos on research papers that you're writing for university. Do your own research. Oh shit. Okay. So I forgot. I actually, I had my script pulled up because I had made notes on it of things that I specifically wanted to talk about in the director's commentary. And I forgot to talk about some things. So real quick, just doubling back for like a second. When I talked about him purchasing a ship, uh, for going out on his pirate escapade instead of, you know, the norm of stealing a ship, he actually was rather smart about it. So he purchased a sloop, which is actually the favored type of pirate ship. You know, a lot of people like to think pirate ships are like these really grand big warships with fuckloads of guns and firepower and all that. But that's not really what you want with a pirate ship. What you want with a pirate ship is um, something that's fast, nimble, that can quickly approach ships and quickly get the fuck away from ships. So like this is the picture of the sloop that he bought based off of artwork that I saw. So basically suggests that he probably had a good idea of what kind of ships pirates gravitated towards from his reading at the time. Now a very common way to portray Steed Bonnet is this like absolute dumbass idiot who didn't really know anything and was just kind of going like la 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 I want to be a pirate and shoot guns and steal shit, but we don't really know how accurate something like that was. It's just because the like series of events of his life make him seem rather silly, going from plantation owner, rich, well-respected gentleman of an island to pirate. While he certainly was rather silly with his decisions, which I think is just undeniable by the series of events here, it doesn't mean he's like completely void of any kind of merit. So the fact that he chose a ship that was something that was notable for being a good choice for pirates, and then also hired a crew to help man the ship and also gave them a salary so they would feel theoretically rather attached to having him as a captain as opposed to someone that's easily disposable shows that maybe he put in more thought than some like clickbaity buzzfeed type articles give him credit for and so i just wanted to make sure i pointed that out and then oh there's something else i wanted to talk about real quick so i show this is ubisoft's depiction of the revenge and one thing i wanted to talk about real quick just like a little side story was that ubisoft has actually done some pretty neat things in the past for their research 
search for Assassin's Creed games. Ubisoft gets a lot of shit, deservedly so in some instances, for poor game design and predatory microtransactions and all that fun jazz. But they've also done some really, really cool things because there are passionate people at Ubisoft, which is evident by the fact that one thing that they did was for the game Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag, they funded the genetic reconstruction of a pirate's face from DNA that they had, an 18th century pirate called Amaro Pargo. So basically, here's a Reddit post that's trustworthy. So in order to promote Assassin's Creed Black Flag, Ubisoft funded the exhumation, DNA testing, and facial reconstruction of famous 18th century pirate Amaro Pargo, which I think is really cool. They actually spent the money and resources to fund genetic research on a pirate so that they can try to get like an accurate facial construction and model of this guy for Assassin's Creed Black Flag. Just a fun fact, you know, like just like something kind of like that they didn't have to do, but they did to put in that extra effort to make something historically accurate for their game. Of course, you know, part of it is PR and trying to sell the game more, showing that they did something cool like DNA reconstruction. But I still think, you know, regardless of the fact that they get brownie points from like the public for doing it, I still think it's cool that they did it at all. All right, so just hang out in the quarters here and let me worry about the captaining. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I kind of feel like a lazy prisoner though. No, no. Think of it as an uh, apprenticeship. You're going to be learning the most important part about being a pirate, Yarg. Low risk plundering tactics? Uh, Yarg, spot on, matey. And you can learn with, uh, with this. M Monopoly? There'd be no better way to learn theft than capitalism, matey. Uh, okay. And should I also start sticking lit fuses in my hair? What? Oh, shit. <laughs> wow, that could have been bad. I swear they have a mind of their own. They do. Anyway, to work with ye. Pirating be tough work fit for only the strongest men. Sir, you're uh missing ice cream time. You better have saved pistachio. I, I don't know why it'd be so funny to just have him <laughs> as being like a dude who's just like really into ice cream. Just a little goofy little thing I had there. But I had mentioned it earlier, people failing to separate the thoughts of characters from the author. I had Blackbeard make a joke that was like, there be no better way to learn theft than capitalism, matey. And so many people were like, what the fuck do you have against capitalism? Capitalism, like, uh, Blue Jay's a commie or a tanky, but I guess I'll still watch him. Or like, ew, I can't believe you're a tanky, Blue Jay. What the fuck? And I'm like, dude, what the f Blackbeard said that shit, not me. First of all, it's just funny to make fun of any economic system. I don't care what it is, but just saying like capitalism is theft or like communism is just like starvation. Like all these like different types of like critiques that are popular. It's just funny, man. Why can't people just make fun of the shit that they're a part of? I like to poke fun at America and capitalism, even though I'm a part of it, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm like, yeah, bro, Joseph Stalin was the goat. Like, ugh, I'm never going to, like, get into my political beliefs in detail in anything because I, I don't know, I just don't think that's something I want to do. But I'm not, like, making some kind of crazy anti-capitalist statement here. I'm just making a stupid fucking joke. And it just, it's so funny because, like, no matter what you say, people will always draw their own conclusions. It is unavoidable. And I'm not going to, like, compromise the comedy or, like, like the vision of what I'm trying to write to appease people who just have zero media literacy. But yeah, I mean, the reason I had him make that joke is that kind of like inherently piracy is seen as kind of like an anti-capitalist like movement in a sense that kind of like spawns piracy. It's very anti-capitalist. It's very socialist actually and communist because, you know, often shares of plunder split throughout the entirety of the crew evenly. Some people like the captains and quartermaster get greater shares because of their greater workload. You know, it, it's kind of seen as like anti-capitalist in a way. So I thought it'd be fun to have him make a joke at like poking fun at capitalism because, you know, like that's kind of like what they are. They're like anarchist groups of like equal democracy. Um, I guess not anarchist. I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just throwing out buzzwords at this point. But it, it wasn't like supposed to be some kind of like political statement that a good number of people took it as. I think most people understand Blackbeard said that, not this blue jay down here in the corner with a talking PNG. I'm never going to give you economic advice. Just know that. I will make jokes. Oh, what else was I going to say about this skit? Blackbeard and Steed Bonnet were probably actually like legitimate friends during this time. I know it's kind of like portrayed as like Blackbeard completely taking advantage of Steed here. I think he was taken advantage of for his uh, resources because at the time Steed's ship was better equipped and bigger than Blackbeard's ship. So it was a very favorable setup for Blackbeard who was at this time kind of like an 
up-and-coming guy. He wasn't like the legend that we would come to know him as later. He was getting a start. No one really knew his name. So um, this arrangement was good because it just doubled up Blackbeard's overall manpower. Uh, also gave him kind of like this, just like some good resources, a good ship, a good crew. But, you know, the, given by the fact that he didn't throw Seed Bonnet overboard or like get rid of him and let him stay in his personal quarters and literally just chill and enjoy the fruits of his ship's labor is a sign that they actually did have a true friendship because it would have been so much easier, more profitable, just kind of like fucking get rid of Steed and take a ship and his crew who would rather probably have worked with a more experienced sailor than this fucker right here. A few weeks later, according to some versions of the story, Blackbeard would get a new flagship and separate from Bonnet after reinstating him as captain. Yeah, that was his iconic Queen Anne's revenge like he's famous for later on that he would acquire and then leave. Uh, and I say according to some versions of the story because different versions say different things like the timeline of when they were together and separated and back together again and separated again is kind of like a little up in the air. I went with the most believable story from my own research, but just know that there are different versions that say different like series of events, but ultimately the major plot points are the same. Fast forwarding a little bit because believe it or not, there are other pirates I want to talk about. Both Blackbeard and Bonnet decided to surrender themselves for a pardon. I was about to write a whole other ass section of this guy's story right here. And I remember looking down at my script and seeing I'm on page like eight or nine. And I'm like, ooh, my original plan included many other pirates that I wanted to talk about. I, I planned on talking about three pirates in particular in some pretty good depth and then throwing in Somali pirates at the end. Steed Bonnet's story from start to finish was entertaining to me. I couldn't find parts that I wanted to just cut out. I think all of it was necessary to tell. Honestly, dude could have had his own independent video, but I chose to do a little multi-story video. And I mentioned that at the beginning of the video, um, I wanted to show the parallel between piracy in the golden age and piracy in the modern age with Somali pirates, showing that while we have very different visions of these like eras of piracy, we view pirates in this time as like the fun cat, like parts of the Caribbean swashbuckling sexy guys versus pirates in the modern age as like dirty criminals that we don't like and we find disgusting. And it's really sad because they're essentially the same and they're both from like disadvantaged backgrounds and low social status. Um, and there's really not much difference there, but that's essentially why I made it into a multi-story video. Therefore, any and all pirates, scallywags, and or marauders who surrender thyselves before the 5th of January in the year of our king, 1718, shall be pardoned one time only for all their crimes. All crimes, you say? Including the most heinous. Does that include stabbing Spanish people? Uh, yes. And all other peoples as well. I don't want a pardon for the French ones. What about eating stolen sushi with a knife and fork? The king will forgive you, but I can't say God will. How about the smearing of copious amounts of butter on doorknobs and or floors to make people sticky? That's... That's not a crime. That's just weird. But what if... Now here's an example of said proclamation in action, as I will now pardon myself for the murder of that little shit. Now I trust you're all done wasting my time. Ah, uh -uh, you said you only get one pardon. There's actually a lot of fun stuff about that skit. That's actually probably my favorite skit in the whole video. It still cracks me up watching it. Usually what I do for gunshot effects is I just like show like a muzzle flash PNG for like a frame or two. But for this one, because it's a flintlock that this guy pulls out, I'm like, eh, you know, like a little like nine millimeter muzzle flash isn't really gonna cut it. And also I kind of want to have fun with it. I've, you know, I just got done thinking about how I want to do this animation at the beginning of the video, the cinematic opening, which I hadn't done at this point, but I was thinking about how like I wanted to do all these like different fluid animations for it. And gas is just essentially a fluid. It behaves like a fluid in the air. And so I thought it'd be fun to, you know, play around with like a little fluid animation and actually frame by frame animate the muzzle flash and consequent smoke blast of like getting shot. So I drew each individual one of these frames for the gunshot here. So, oh, you can see like the first one right here. As he pulls the trigger, the hammer comes down. You get a little spark. That spark then gets a little brighter as you see some smoke blast out of various escape points of essentially the, the piece of flint that comes down and strikes the striker to ignite the little pouch of black powder that then ignites, obviously. And you get a little smoke blast from 
from the ignition here and then that flash dissipates as it becomes more of a smoke cloud as then you get the fire blast from the black powder igniting inside the barrel of the gun expelling the bullet which I didn't choose to draw because I thought you know it's going fast enough I don't need to draw it and then you have this gas becoming more dissipated less opaque as it moves forward along with the flow of the air and the wind and then you have the smoke coming out of the barrel here as you get like a bigger plume of a cloud here with various like levels of opacity and just various like accenting lines and then you have like the bullet hole with the blood being expelled a little bit but you know most of the blood would be coming out of the back of the head so there's not much on the front as he's then blown off the screen oh yeah his arm went up with the recoil there the smoke cloud continues to go out dissipating the smoke cloud from the ignition also goes out and dissipates then the blood eventually falls to the ground in a nice little pile but I just wanted to like frame by frame animate that and then I did the same thing right here <laughs> I just love this skit so much, the timing. I actually had looked up some videos from some really nice animators on explosive animations. So I used what I learned from that process and actually applied it on a smaller scale here because I had enough time to do it. So the flintlock again ignites. I also watched some YouTube videos and people just shooting flintlocks to see how they would you know, flow. I say that I threw away my chemical engineering degree by going into this line of work, but I shit you not, animation has so much math and science behind it. It's crazy. Just for a little taste of it watch corridor crew they there are a bunch of animators and visual effects artists that talk about in detail how you can make animations look more realistic by just applying some general physics knowledge understanding fluid dynamics so there's various things that you can do to like make your animations just look better even if you're not the greatest artist of all time just by following physics because humans our eyes are wired to understand physics i don't know is it a good idea to pop three-year expired acids when you have a stomach ache is it? That's an actual film I actually have those. I took some like the day of uploading this video too. <laughs> I've had those for like six years or something crazy and I just thought it was funny. Like that was like a last minute change to the script. I didn't have that written in the original script and no it, it's not bad. So basically Tom's and acids. Idea to pop the active ingredient is, is I'm pretty sure just calcium carbonate. Some things when they expire that's not gonna break down into anything dangerous. That's calcium and carbon. Like when things expire usually just means the dosage is less potent or sometimes it just means that the container that the thing is in is uh, starting to degrade things just need expiration dates like that's where you see expiration dates on bottles of water so no I, I knew this was fine to take I thought it would be funny to just be like is this okay guys I've been taking these for years now <laughs> and I had so many comments that were like hey pharmacist here yeah it's safe to take you'll be fine and I was like thank you so much <laughs> it's really funny I tweeted about that too actually when Bonnet returned to his ship pardon in hand he found that Blackbeard had one more surprise in store for him the legendary pirate was long gone, having taken with him all of the loot, as well as various weapons, provisions, supplies, and the best crewmen. Some other things I wanted to talk about here, so this really makes it look like Blackbeard completely fucked over Steed Bonnet. And he did. He fucked him over, you know, he took all this shit and left. They both had went to go get a pardon, so they could stop being pirates, take their plunder, and, you know, like, find other lines of work. Steed Bonnet's original plan was to go down to, to seek a, a license for privateering, which, as we mentioned earlier, is essentially the least legal form of piracy. That's where you get um, a letter of marquee from a government which says you work for this government. As long as you attack certain ships and raid them, you have government backing. So like it was really famous during the, the War of Spanish Succession during the early 1700s. Letters of marquee were given out willy-nilly, uh, especially to British sailors, basically to disrupt supply lines from the Spanish and the French. Basically you would get state backing to do legal piracy where you would just raid merchant ships from other countries not the country that gave you the letter of marquee the permission and then you can help you know fuck them over disrupt their supply lines but the problem is once that war was done all these letter of marquees were then you know rescinded we were like okay we're not at war with them anymore stop attacking them <laughs> and then for these people who have for years now come to rely on privateering for a way of life for all of their income for surviving are just like what the fuck man what do I do now because this isn't like oh man my my, my like warehouse shut down I guess I go work at another warehouse no the whole government was like this line of work is now done we don't need you anymore you can't just go to another government you're kind of fucked you have to find a completely new career path and that's not a very easy thing to do so for a lot of these people they were just kind of like I'm just gonna keep doing it because I'm already doing it successfully just this time I'm gonna either still not attack the British ships or the Spanish ships or whoever gave you your letter of marquee or sometimes they started attacking them too because now they don't 
don't have government backing. You know, obviously that's risky because that means that now you can be killed for it and arrested. But I mean, on the other hand, people were kind of like, I could have been arrested by the Spanish anyway because they don't want me stealing from their ships. So it's just kind of like a big mess. <laughs> Letters of Marquis were very iconic in history, especially around like the 1700s, 1600s and stuff like that. 1800s even, I think too. So important actually that the US Constitution reserves the right to give out Letters of Marquis to modern US sailors. So like the government today could go to like some guy who has a boat and give him a Letter of Marquis, basically US backed permission to raid cargo ships, do what Somali pirates do, but legally instead of like, you know, ransoming people, just steal their cargo. So like that's still a thing in the Constitution. That's how iconic this type of work was seen. And that's how important it was. I mean, obviously in our modern day ecosystem, in our maritime environment, we don't really want to have like private yachts going around just raiding cargo ships. You know, we have a big enough US Navy to do that for us if we needed to. So it's obviously not something that's going to be granted today. But basically it was something that was prevalent around this time. So that was Steve Bonnet's plan. He was going to go acquire a letter of marquee, keep doing what he's doing, but this time without it being classified as piracy so that he, his pardon can be in full effect. He's no longer a criminal. He is now a good English man doing his God-given work from for the king and shit. But yeah, so as we'll now learn though, he's very mad at Blackbeard. And according to some versions of the story, again, this is where I'm talking about how we're speculating about history because we don't know this part for a fact. People believe that he sought revenge after Blackbeard, that he was going to hunt him down because he fucked him over. And I completely forgot the other thing I was going to say. While Blackbeard did fuck him over, he could have done a lot worse, which is why some people believe that this was kind of like an amicable fuck over. He fucked him over, but he did it like a gentleman because when Blackbeard left, around this time, the Queen Anne's revenge had been sunk. People believe, actually, a part of the crewmen of Blackbeard believed that he did it intentionally so that he could then, like, downsize his crew, go get his pardon, and just yeet out of here. So at this point, they were left with two ships. They had Steed Bonnet's Revenge, this, his sloop that from, the, like, his OG, and they also had acquired a new sloop at this point that was smaller. Um, it wasn't as well equipped, more nimble. It was the lesser of the two boats. When Blackbeard left and we took a lot of the loot, not all of the loot, but a lot of the loot, and some equipment and supplies, not everything, but a good amount of it, and then all the best crewmen, he went on the smaller, lesser valuable boat and left, leaving the revenge for Bonnet to keep, along with some crew and some loot that he had. So that's kind of interesting, right? Like you'd think if you're trying to fuck this guy over, you would either take the better ship and sink the other one, or at least just take the better ship. But he didn't. He he took his ship. He left stuff that was on the revenge there for Steed Bonnet to have. He then took off. So there are a couple ways you can view this. You can view it as, okay, Blackbeard still had, he still wanted to respect Steed Bonnet. He wanted to completely fuck him over, but he wanted to fuck him over a little bit, right? Because he's still like selfish after all, and he's leaving to enjoy the rest of his life and continue doing what he's doing, which would be piracy that he would end up die in combat. On the other hand, you could also view it as, you know, he's trying to take the smaller, faster ship being more undercover, and he just didn't want to take the bigger boat. But it's not like that much bigger, so it's just kind of like, you know, it, it's, it's what, what do you want to believe here? It's hard to say for sure what happened. There are very good arguments attesting to the fact that this was more of an amicable fuck over, I guess is the way I'm putting it now. And Steed didn't want to seek revenge after Blackbeard, because as it's rightfully described, around this time, getting revenge against other pirates is kind of unheard of. That doesn't really happen. There aren't many instances where pirates seek revenge against other pirates, because it's just like not worth it. In fact, a lot of piracy, which I, I try to highlight a little bit in this video, but I'm not, I'm going to probably highlight in a future video on pirates, which, spoiler alert, I want to make more videos on pirates. A lot of what a pirate's goal was, was not to actually engage in combat and put their lives in the line. They wanted to put on kind of like a threatening display and try to, without any violence and loss of limbs and life, take what they need and get out of there. So it doesn't make sense to put your life on the line to get revenge against pirates, especially when you're not really getting much out of it because you're you're not attacking wealthy, like low laden merchants filled with all these nice like tobaccos and, and cloth and shit. You're attacking these dirty pirates who have like, you know, some salted beef, I guess. So it's like you don't get much incentive out of doing stuff like that. It's just it's not really worth it. And, and you have to convince an entire crew too to go after some pirate or a pirate crew on this like revenge escapade. So, you know, it's what's believed. And that's why I try to like phrase my wording like that. But I want to like reiterate, we don't know, know for sure if Steed Bonnet was actually seeking revenge after Blackbeard. We don't know for sure if Blackbeard was actually trying to completely screw over Steed Bonnet. As is evident by what was left for Bonnet, it looks like it could have been like him taking what he wants and leaving 
anything, but leaving enough for Steed to be well off on his own. So that's kind of the situation we're presented with here. Take it with a grain of salt. I just kind of went with this version of events because this is what is most widely reported in the sources that I read. But these sources also equally expressed a doubt on this aspect of the story. So we don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Pleasure doing business with you. A an old cable? This is worthless. Uh, uh, uh. The value comes from your imagination. Check this out. Now, can you imagine what I could do with this? Boop. So, as mentioned before, this is a very Archer-inspired episode. That little boop was actually also kind of like another little Archer reference. There are a few times in Archer where he'll be like, poke each other and be like, boop. Or I don't think they actually ever say boop, but they have like these like little to go tinfoil cranes that you'll see. So like this is how they'll get like leftovers from restaurants. And like there was like one scene where like Archer was like, oh, like come now. Bok bok and like bops him with like the crane. So like it was just like another little like nod to Archer. They do say boop. Okay, cool. Yeah, so boop. Just another little inspired by Archer skit. After the Somali government collapsed in the 90s, foreign powers exploited the unregulated Somali waters for their various dumping and or fishing needs this what little picture not a great guy i'll give you nine guesses as to what gives that away <laughs> he's the former president of somalia president you know dictator you know you kind of call him what you want to call him obviously not a great guy it's really interesting because if you talk to somalis and ask them what they think of him you'll find a lot of people say that he was kind of effective but obviously flawed which is just really interesting when you're talking about a dude who has like a genocide on his wikipedia entry because he he was not a great guy and uh he committed genocide which is obviously always bad. What's really interesting is that I found people that were of the ethnic group that were the victims of this genocide supporting him in some instances, which confuses me. In my mind, I think that they are people from after the genocide took place, and so maybe they don't have as many like experiences from that time frame. But I I'm obviously, you know, I'm just talking about like a few people that I've seen talk about him, not like the general populace. I don't know the general Somali consensus of Saeed Barre. I don't know how to say his name right, but um, you know, not a great guy. Unregulated Somali. Molly waters for their various dumping and or fishing needs. But yeah, it was really messed up. Like the whole origins behind Somali piracy, which if you want to learn more about a really good resource on like the rise and fall of Somali pirates. Yeah, Johnny Harris here. He made a, a really good video that goes in depth about like the rise and fall of Somali pirates. Like why did it become a thing? Why was it a big deal in specifically Somalia and not other places? And a lot of it just comes from from how taken advantage they were as a people. Because given the climate where they're at, they don't have much arid land for crops. They're very reliant on fishing and their sea for a source of nourishment and just surviving. So then once their government fell, they didn't have a Navy or Coast Guard or anyone enforcing their own like uh, sovereign claim to their waters. So you would have foreign companies, so like Italian based companies, which was the former colonizer of Somalia and companies from like Iran, that would come in and fish in their waters and just really damage it. Do some of that nice like trawling where they just kind of like fuck up the entire sea floor and take all the fish. And then you would have people dump. This is an actual picture taken off the coast of Somalia of just chemical waste dumped into their sea where it's just cheap. They would pay Somalis to dump their chemical waste into their coast. And because they had no one enforcing the laws of their maritime waters, it was just easy and cheap to do. So pretty sad, pretty messed up. But yeah, this is kind of like why they ended up doing what they did. So Somali pirates started off by just basically like trying to fight off these fishermen to stake their claim in their waters, stealing from them to make some money back, and then eventually doing the ransoming that we kind of know them for and have seen them in like Captain Phillips for doing. So it's like, it's weird because you kind of feel bad for them, but it doesn't excuse the violence. And you'll see that more when you look into how Somali piracy developed, because at first it seemed kind of like, like a civilian defense of their waters, but then it evolved into having these like Somali pirate warlords who were like millionaires, just like raking in cash and making a fuckload of money, letting this piracy get organized and develop into just like a big booming multi-billion dollar business with investors from international companies. So obviously it got to the point where it's not as like wholesome. It's just a source of profit. It's a business at that point. Hey, what's going on out there? Um, nothing. What's that over there?
I think this is the last this Archer reference in the video. Or there's a recurring joke where they're like, smoke bomb! And then they like, just like throw their hand down and run away. Like there's no actual smoke. So that's like a little smoke bomb joke from Archer. You can probably imagine the French crew got a good laugh out of this. I mean, Somali pirates and glorified canoes attacking a warship in the middle of the night was probably the stupidest thing to ever happen to them. Until six months later when it happened again. <laughs> again? <laughs> you guys. It's so funny, like, it's hard to find that story when you research about it. There are so many reports about Somali pirates attacking military ships, and it's just hilarious to think about that prospect. You can understand why, though. Like, you look at the Somme, it's a command ship for naval forces, but it's not like, you know, like a ship of the line, like a, like a man of war type ship or like a destroyer. It doesn't look exactly like a big, scary, dangerous warship when you're thinking about, like, looking at it at night, especially considering the fact that these pirates are coming up in these little fucking dinghies they're in skivs and you're like in the waves of the open ocean you're close to the waterline you're bobbing and rocking you're a small little boat on the vast open sea you don't have like the most stable footing to look at things in the distance you would imagine you know so you can understand why you can make these mistakes so i'm trying to like highlight it's not like somalis are just idiots it's just like the situation brewed conditions where it just like is hard to identify what's a cargo ship and what's a warship sometimes not always we'll see examples where it doesn't doesn't like make sense to me at least why they would attack these warships I did see some like really weird comments I don't know what's going on people are so much more comfortable these days just being racist or maybe it's because I have more people watching my stuff than ever before so I just see more comments but I saw like a bunch of people saying something along the lines of like yeah just Somalis just aren't as educated or like they don't know they're just like because of where they're from they're stupid and they don't know things and so that's why they attacked warships and I'm just like oh Oh man, what a take. <laughs> it's just crazy that you can just see people say stuff like that these days, man. Like, oh, god damn. I know it's a minority, which is, thank god, but people are terrible, always. It has nothing to do with where they're from. They're not lesser because of their culture or background. They just made a mistake, like we all do. Who doesn't attack warships on accident? You know, I probably would. I've definitely taken on bigger ships than I could chew in Assassin's Creed Black Flag, so who, who's to say? Now, you're probably waiting for me to say this happened yet a third time, and you'd be wrong. This has happened like dozens of times, and not just with this ship, mind you. I found stories of pirates attacking warships from not only France, but from Spain, America, the Netherlands, Kenya, and so on. <laughs> I love that one, the specifically this article. Somali pirates mistakenly attack Dutch warship oops it's so funny yeah it's like these have happened so many times but you often find like very like little reported articles and it's stuff like that that makes me think like man like this is like probably one of the most modern stories i've ever covered on my channel but hundreds of years from now if there was another me going back and talking about funny pirates and wanted to talk about somali pirates they're gonna have a hard time piecing together this history because you don't have this as like in-depth reported as you would want because like some of these articles are like literally like just like an ap news report a few sentences saying like the bare minimum facts and that's why I like piecing together these stories they're not like super detailed in this first story like the first time I don't know if the Psalm fired back in my skit I showed him firing his machine gun I don't know if they did in the second instance when they were attacked it was said that they fired warning shots back at the pirates so I'm like maybe they did the first time too I don't know you don't get these details sometimes and I don't know why people don't fucking give them uh are we sure this is a cargo ship yeah look you can see the containers right there uh, what about that long angled tube pointed precariously outward as if in an aiming fashion. Oh. Well, that's obviously a pool noodle. Pool noodle. What ship has a 30 foot long pool noodle sticking outside of a big box? I don't know, Dan, a water park supply ship for fat Americans? Just fucking grab the AK and let's steal some floaties. This is one thing that I do actually wish I could have done a little differently. <laughs> I really wanted to have this boat bobbing um, and maybe having some like waves coming up along the side because they're on an ocean in a little skiv. But uh, if I had more time, that's another thing I would have changed. I would have gone back. I would have added a little bit more wiggling to that. But uh, yeah, it's, I would have like added, animated that like a little bit more. But I mean, it doesn't detract from it. I still think it's one of my favorite skits. I think it's really good. It's just like the, I don't know, man. It's like a pool noodle. I was trying to think like, how can you like, how can you look at the ship? How can you see? this massive gun that's a real picture of the ship and then go like yeah that one let's get that one it's just so funny i mean i explain why they might not have seen it here in a second but still it's just funny to me wacky pirates 12 out of 10 stars
Yay! Oh man, look at these beautiful Patreon supporters. Some of them are in chat right now, like Amber. Um, so yeah, that was my video on how the, the worst pirates you've never heard of. Overall, it seems like you guys really liked it. I'm really happy to see that. I think this video came out really well. It's really funny because my original plan was to make an eight minute video. Oops. It's really hard these days. <laughs> I planned the same thing with the Lobster War video and that was like 17 minutes, but I just, I think with how much I feel like I'm getting better at writing, I am able to express more details in a story to a level that I think is entertaining and engaging enough so that I don't think that it's too boring. Like back in the day on like some of these older videos, I cut out a lot. I stuck to the main points and I just kind of like worked off of that because I wasn't, I guess to a point where I am now where I felt like I could make less entertaining things more entertaining but now I'm able to cover like the entire details that we know about Steed Bonnet um, in a way that's concise and efficient because you could spend more time on him of course but also just you know it's more in depth but also still entertaining to me at least some things that are different my narration has gotten a lot more confident and whimsical I've had people compare it to MatPat which is just interesting um, but my narration has definitely changed over time like if you listen to like how I sounded in older videos I'm a lot more relaxed and I don't know just I just sound different like even like a year ago so I was looking through my YouTube analytics the other day and discovered two things like you can see that's like a little bit more relaxed right in this I'm I'm more like whimsical and insane that's how I like to describe it Pointed by the missile cruiser the USS Cape St. George I have a little bit more of a swing to my voice as you could say I had someone say that like I had like a really harsh comment saying they didn't like it most people said that they like think my narration is good but I'm like you know maybe I should tone it back a bit I don't know I think it's kind of like a taste thing because like I can see this as being over the top a little bit like it seems like like it's more directed for engagement, but I'm not really intending it to be like that. So I don't know. I, I don't know if I should try like toning it down a little bit or kind of continue going with the type of like narration that I'm going with now. So I'm a little undecided. I might experiment. I might like go back a little bit. I might like go further a little bit. Who knows? It's something that I am probably going to constantly change and get better at or worse at. Who knows? As long as you enjoy it, the people will enjoy. It. Yeah. And that's always been my rule of thumb really is I want to make videos that I like. If I think it's good, I'm going to do that. So, but yeah, that's my pirate video. Expect a part two, not the next video, but in the future. Any questions though? Do you know what Steed Bonnet Kid died of? I honestly don't know. I don't either. I couldn't find anything detailed about why Steed Bonnet's kid died. We just know that he did, or she. Now that's another thing, is we don't actually know the exact gender of the kid. It's widely believed to be a he, but some people say it was a she. But then also, we kind of just know about his family because of baptism records. Which is, you know, say what you want about religion, but like, they do a really good job preserving historical record. That's why we know a lot about the specific details about Steed Bonnet and his birth date and like his kid's birth date and who his kids were and who his wife was because they have baptism records for them. And then while other records are destroyed, like the US government doesn't do a good enough job sometimes keeping court documents safe, those baptism records have survived and that's why we know about his kids and that one of them had died. I believe that's why we know one of them died. Do you have a bank of stock assets like that ham on the table? I do. These were new though. I drew this fish, I drew these grapes, these bulls, these hams, these plates. These, all this cutlery and everything. The only stock assets here was this wine bottle. This I first drew in my Wacky Duels video, uh, specifically for the skit, the uh, like those two, Lord William Byron, arguing with a friend of his about the proper way to prepare game birds after they were shot. And if you remember, that's actually another example of a long-winded skit that I had. So in this video here, right around here, these wine bottles. This is an example of um, one of my earliest really long-winded skits, escalating arguments arguing back and forth. I really love this skit so much, but I also got complaints about it here. That's where I first drew them, so that's like a stock asset. She was also first drawn in my first fashion video, my first wacky fashion. You first see her right around here. This is the first appearance of this wonderful lady aristocrat. That's the thing I want to get better at. I tend to reuse female characters of mine more than I draw new ones, especially compared to male characters, just because the hair can take more time. It's so much easier to draw a bald guy, even though this hair didn't take me long. It just takes more time and you have to draw hair behind them too. You need to like move the layers differently so that like when you move the head, you don't like expose part of the unfinished hair underneath and you gotta like keep it like, it's just more work. So I tend to reuse them. And I kind of wish I drew a new wife for Steed here, but she looked perfect for the role. You know, her son hat for like my character of like
like a nagging wife. I don't know. I just thought she worked well. So I reused her. She also was first drawn for my also the wacky fashion video. I think, yeah, at the very beginning here, she was laughing at the kid falling down with the Heelys in the hallway. Man, it's so awesome. I can remember all these details. He was also from that same skit. I use, reuse a lot of kids from this skit. Timmy is a recurring character in all my videos. You've seen him all the time. His iconic nose. A clear reference to the famous Bone series by Jeff Smith. I love those comics. So I, I reuse this guy, this gal, this gal, and this wine bottle. And everything else is new here. What skits didn't make it? Oh, juicy questions now. Let's see. So I had I had a skit that I cut because I couldn't find a way to make it like super satisfying. Right around... It was here, sorry. Tired of it and would gladly leave it all behind to live life anew in Spain or Portugal. A few I was going to have a skit there where Steve Bonnet was talking to his like crew members like saying like they want to go to Spain and like a pirate was like I, I can't like talk about the details because eventually I'm going to be animating these skits and putting them on Patreon so it's kind of exclusive for the people that pay for these extra perks but it was going to be him like with a skit like talking about dreaming about going to Spain and everyone like makes fun of him so that was a skit that was cut I also had another skit I was going to do where he go like right after I say like he's about to kickstart his new career on the high seas I was going to have a skit where he's leaving home and like his like son's like uh okay papa when are you coming back and he was gonna like fuck with George a little bit again so there was like a whole other skit that I was gonna do there but I ended up cutting it just because I had a lot of skits like it was gonna be this skit a paragraph of narration another skit a paragraph of narration and then another skit and I'm like this is just too many skits so I ended up cutting that one too so yeah there were about like three skits that were cut and then other ones that were different ideas and evolved uh anyway that was the uh director's commentary thank you all for stopping by i hope you enjoyed the director's commentary and just hearing my little erratic crazy thoughts into what i'm doing good night everyone